Uh, welcome to everybody. This is the top 21 video session. Uh, for those of you, if, if you want, there's a few, few other seats on this side of the room as well. Uh, we appreciate your being here. Hopefully you all had a good lunch and enjoyed some of the sun outside during the lunch break. Uh, it's a top 21 video session, but what we've done is we've pared it down because of time constraints to the top 15. So we have 15 videos selected out of the top 21. And if you've seen the top 21 video collection, it's really uh, video descriptions of how you do the operations. And so the session is designed to have the speakers not replay the video only, but to try and highlight some of the key steps of the operation and potentially any problems that you might run into. We set it up so that each video will have a period for questions and answers afterwards. Um, I believe we'll be done on time and at the end of it all at 5.30 if you're here at 5.30. Um, my co-chair for the session is Ben Schneider from Boston, and I'm Ken Moriyama from Philadelphia. We're going to start a little bit out of order here. We're going to start with the laparoscopic distal and subtotal pancreatectomy because the speaker, Dr. Horacio Asman, has another uh, commitment that he has to be at. So without further ado, we'll get started and try and make sure we stay on time with things. Uh, to the speakers, please identify if you have a conflict or if there are any issues, uh, and we'll be sure to try and remember to do so as well. Uh, the last thing I'll tell you is that if you look closely at the bottom of your, the page in your program or if you look at the online version of the program, there is a way to text or tweet or email uh, questions to us up here at the podium and they'll come out on the computer up here so we'll be able to get the questions directly. So uh, if you're good at texting, it, the number is 22333 so it's not that difficult a number and you text top 21 and the question you would like to submit. Uh, if we don't get to your question because of the numbers of questions submitted, I, we apologize up front, but we'll get to as many as we can and still stay within the, within the time constraints that we have. Uh, so, Dr. Asbin? Thank you, Dr. Nurayama and Dr. Schneider. And I want to take the opportunity to, to commend Dr. Nurayama, who leads the, the Committee on uh, uh, Educational Resources at SAGES. And they do a lot of work to be able to have these products out to you. They not only request from, from authors to do it, but they review them and they put them together in a way that makes sense. Then I'm going to be talking about distal and subtotal pancreatectomy, basically the same technique. And uh, as Dr. Norayama has said, we won't be able to present the whole video, and, but I'm going to present certain segments and I'm going to fast forward. And we're going to stop up at the areas where I think that tips or tricks may be beneficial. Uh, I have no financial disclosures to relating to this, um, to this uh, lecture. Patient positioning. We like to put the patient position in a modified right lateral decubitus, and if you see, in this area, the, the patient can be, we really uh, secure the patient in the, in the operative table to make sure that we can move the patient uh, sideways. Because when you're doing the medial part of the operation, you want the patient in this position. And when you're doing the spleen and the tail, you want the patient in that position. Then this is neutral without rotation of the table. This, again, is rotating it to the left, and this is rotating it to the right. These simple maneuvers help you tremendously during the surgery, particularly if you are doing a subtotal pancreatectomy, because if you're doing a subtotal pancreatectomy and you have the patient too much on a right lateral decubitus position, you will have trouble accessing the area of the superior mesenteric portal vein trunk. Uh, this is our port positioning. Usually we have four ports, one above the umbilicus, and two fives, and another 12. And this one is where we're going to be putting the stapler for a distal. This is where we're going to be putting the stapler for a subtotal. The surgeon stands to the right of the patient and usually operates from this and this ports. This is the scope, uh, with the exception that we're taking the part of the descending column is going to be operating through the left upper quadrant port. Instrumentation, basic instrumentation, whatever you are, is your preference for advanced laparoscopic surgery. The only instrument that I'm going to show you that is a little different than, than what you may be familiarized if you don't do bariatrics is the finger retractor. To me, this is an instrument that I use in almost every single pancreas that I do. It's very, very useful. It helps you go in, in, uh, and dissect under tight spaces. This is our technique. We re it's published in um, surgical endoscopy. We had uh, 30 patients in a period of 12 months. 
Um, uh, and these are the operating times, very good results, morbidity, et cetera. This is for benign and malignant disease. But let's talk about the technique. We'll, we call it a clockwise because we, want to, we like to start mobilizing the splenic flexure of the colon. We feel that if you enter into the lesser sac through the most lateral portion, you don't have to be fighting with the adipose tissue, particularly in obese patients. If you go into the lesser sac at the gastrocolecomentum, then you always have a bunch of fat here that makes the dissection different, difficult. If you, if you do the dissection in this area, because of the gravity, the whole colon is going to drop down and you're going to be able to expose it. And let me just start with that. This is then the step one is going to be mobilization of the splenic flexure. Step two, we come over here along the inferior edge of the pancreas. Step three, we go under the pancreas. If you're going to do a subtotal, it's under the neck. Step four, it's going to be continuing the dissection posteriorly along the superior edge of the pancreas. And then step five is the mobilization of the spleen. We leave the mobilization of the spleen for the last. Then let me show you a little bit of the step one. And again, here it's, um, even though this seems to be very simple, I think that is the key part of the procedure to start in order to have adequate access. This is the spleen. The head of the patient is over here. Leg, uh, the feet are going to be over here. The patient now is in maximum right uh, side down. This is the colon. You see the, re the gravity retraction gives you a wide space. And you need to try to find the avascular plane between the gyrotus fascia and the colon. This is very reproducible. If you are in the avascular plane, you're going to have to do very little dissection, very little division. It's, it's very uh, basically avascular between it. I'm going to fast forward. Then you come over here, and you can see that. And then you, you're separating the area on the, on the kidney. And then you, now you go up. This is the gyrotus fascia exposed. The pancreas is going to be here. See, we're a complete mobilization of the splenic flexure. We're pushing the pancreas, and now you go anterior to the pancreas, and you enter into the lesser sac in this area, anterior to the pancreas. Doing that, what it allows you, again, is to have a really good retraction and access. Then once you are there, you, on, you create the window. You can continue going and go up to, the, the, to take down the short gastric vessels. And you see there's no retraction other than gravity. You can see the access you have is great. And then you take down the posterior aspect of the, the attachment between the posterior aspect of the stomach and the pancreas. All of this is the pancreas, already exposed. We haven't done anything to the pancreas other than mobilizing the colon, as I have shown you. That's why I wanted to spend a significant amount of time showing you this part of the procedure. And then you have a, here, this is body, neck of the pancreas is going to be here, and you have the whole exposure of the pancreas uh, uh, just by doing that. Then you go along the inferior edge of the pancreas. I'm not going to spend much time here, again, because of the time limitations. But you can choose if you want to go further down if it is cancer or if you want to go closer to the inferior edge of the pancreas. But basically, you can, you can move around and, and follow the inferior edge of the pancreas. This is the pancreas. And now you come from left to right down to the area where you think you're going to want to divide it. You can go a little bit under the pancreas if you want, if you don't know exactly where the inferior edge is. Now you go under the pancreas. If you're doing a distal pancreatectomy, by now you just lift the pancreas like this, and you can go around with the, um, with the, uh, with the finger retractor. And contrary to what, my, uh, uh, what it is said uh, in regarding the artery, a lot of authors say that you need to separate the artery. We don't. If it is a distal pancreatectomy away from the celiac trunk, we include the artery within the, the specimen. And then we, just, we, apply, we apply a stapler through a technique that I'll show you in a little bit. Um, you have, we have created a window. We do endoscopic ultrasound to make sure we have it. And then you, you see the artery. We create a window superiorly, and we put the stapler. The stapler application is very important. We use the, a compression stapler, and we take our time we use the staple line reinforcement, and then we collapse the stapler for a little bit until the point you have some resistance, and then wait. You wait around 15 seconds. It seems that the pancreatic fluid, they get a little dehydrated, and after you have waited 15 seconds, you can squeeze a little bit more and wait another 15 seconds. It, took us around, you, it takes us around a minute to do two minutes to just close the stapler, but we feel that this is very useful to try to avoid any uh, staple light leaks, or particularly to try to avoid 
breakout of the parenchyma, of the, of the pancreatic parenchyma. You can see after closing it, this is the staple line you get. Very, very nice, usually well opposed. And you don't need to go through the whole pancreas if you, don't, if you don't want to. Here it is now the pancreas and the artery. We put another stapler. And up to now, and knock on wood, we have not had any problems of bleeding after surgery, dividing the artery uh, and the vein in this way. It's very different if your dissection is close to the neck, close to the celiac trunk. On those cases, you definitely have to make sure that you isolate the artery. Then this is a subtotal. Now we're going to come under the edge of the pancreas, subtotal meaning that we're going to go to the, super, to the area of the neck and the superior mesenteric portal vein trunk. We create a window. The trick here is don't get limited and do a small window. Open sideways, both to the right and to the left. That allows you to lift the pancreas and do this under direct visualization. You can appreciate it there is the splenic vein joined the supreme mesenteric portal vein trunk. And the next thing that I show in this video, you don't necessarily have to go all the way across. The majority of the times we can go all the way across, but sometimes we can't. Then if we can't, you just put the stapler again and divide the pancreas partially. You don't need to divide it. You don't need to divide it completely. You come over here, the same, I'm hurrying it up now. And now, once you divide the pancreas partially, uh, then you're going to put the finger retractor. Now remember, on this case, we have isolated the hepatic artery and the splenic artery before doing this. You don't include the, the splenic artery on this stapler because really on top of the neck is not going to be the splenic artery. It's going to be the hepatic artery, and you don't want to confuse it. You want to make sure you dissect this, the hepatic artery away. And that then you can safely put the other stapler line and then divide it. The next step is coming now from superior to inferior. That is a pretty straightforward. Uh, I mean, from uh, superiorly, from from right to left. And um, on this case, where it's we are going to isolate the artery and the vein. If it is subtotal, if it is not subtotal, then you just go and you can do this retraction, separate the last part. Your whole specimen is completely freed except for the area of the spleen. And this is the trick that we use. We put a large intestinal clamp lifting the pancreas up. This is the surgeon's hand. And the other hand is down here that is going to expose the posterior part of the pancreas. Um, you can see the whole pancreas here completely freed up to the area of the spleen. And the last step is taking the spleen out. Um, the spleen out is going to be uh, it's similar like in an esplenectomy. Um, you just start doing the dissection. And you're going to take the specimen out. I'm going to fast forward. Actually, this is usually the speed that I operate. <laughs> <laughs> then we put the specimen out. The majority of the times we do a piecemeal um, uh, morselation inside the back of the spleen. Occasionally, we do a little larger incision, like in this case, around the umbilicus, and we're able to maneuver the specimen. People say, how can you get the whole specimen? It's really putting hands around the bag, and you can just deliver it like this. This is a fourth centimeter incision. And if you're going to do a splenic preservation, and this is the last slide, um, you can do a very good job laparoscopically, I would say better than, than um, open, given the magnification. And um, I'm going to show you how, what type of anatomy you have. This is the splenic artery, celiac trunk. This is the splenic vein, superior mesenteric vein, portal vein. This is going to be the left gastric vein over here. And you can see really nice anatomy. And then after you do the division, we like this technique of using bipolar and harmonic. On the left hand, the bipolar helps you retract and at the same time do small bleeding from the parenchyma. And on the right side, you have the, the, um, the ultrasonic shears that also allow you to do a, a very meticulous dissection. Then you continue here and I'm, you can see the vein. Now, sometimes like in this case, you have to go well into the hilum of the spleen because the parenchyma, of the parenchyma here continues. It's a big mistake to just divide here thinking that you have the whole parenchyma. You need to continue following now the branches. You can see here there's a branch of the splenic vein. This is the bifurcation of the splenic vein, and there's a still pancreatic parenchyma in between them. 
then a lot of people feel, okay, I'm at the hilum cut, and then they leave a small piece of, uh, of pancreas attached to the hilum. Then you need to make sure, and, and this is very variable according to the, diff in, uh, according to the anatomy of the patient. And the, there are many patients, though, again, like in this case, that you have to do an extensive dissection down into the hilum almost at the, at the parenchyma. Again, this is the bifurcation. This is a branch to the inferior pole, and this is a, a, a main branch over there. And with this, I'm going to conclude my presentation. So again, if you want, you can text your, your questions to us at 2233 and text top 21 in your question. There is one question for Dr. Asner. Yeah, there are two questions. One, it says, I'm going to eat some popcorn <laughs> while the video runs, and I am presenting. <laughs> Um, the second question is, what staple loads do you use for pancreatic resection? Do you use a vascular load when taking parenchyma and splenic artery? Uh, it depends. It depends the, con the, the characteristic of the specimen, um, of the uh, parenchyma itself. Usually towards the tail, I tend to use um, a white load or a blue load. Very rarely I use a gray load, unless I'm doing it at the hilum of the spleen almost. Um, you get a feeling by the, the amount of resistance that the, the stapler is going to give you. Very often I use blue or green load when there is a thick part in the body. At the neck, you normally use a white load because the neck is usually very, uh, very thin. But the, the size of the stapler depends on the characteristics of the parenchyma, both in thickness and hardness. The important point, again, is to close that stapler very slowly and allow for the tissue to, to, I call it dehydrate, because as, as, you, as you compress it, you wait a little longer and you can see that you can compress a little bit more up to the point that there's more resistance. You wait another 15 seconds and all of a sudden you can compress more until the stapler closes. It's very difficult to prove scientifically, but I think our low uh, leak rate may be due to that, be, being patient when you're closing the stapler. Do you leave a drain in? Depends what, uh, how I feel. It's not scientific. The majority of the times I don't, but if I think that it has been a difficult uh, dissection, I leave a drain. So there's another question here from the audience. And feel free to come to the microphones as well if you have questions. Also for the artery, blue or green. When the artery is included in the parenchyma, I don't make a difference uh, of what stapler I use. If the artery is being ligated by itself, like if when I'm, going, when I'm doing... Um, uh, subtotal pain catectomy and I dissected the artery in 360 degrees, then I use a vascular because it's just the artery without any tissue surrounding it. All right, thank Great. you very much. Thank you very much.